Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Charlotte Buchanan Yale. I'm the director of the Museum of Native American History. And this is not the museum. It's broadcasting from my undisclosed location in my basement because we have ice on the roads here in Arkansas today. Um, today is uh, our presentation on animal medicine ways and experiences. It is absolutely my honor to um, sit in on this discussion today and uh, and actually it turns out I'm going to be a part of it because some I'm just here to do that. I'm here to whatever Mark tells me to do. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the museum uh, before we get going. We do, uh, it's very important that we tell the story of the first people uh, from all of the Americas in our uh, collection of artifacts, but it's also important that we highlight the diversity of, the, of indigenous people that are making history today and doing good work um, and educate future generations. So our focus in coming up in 2021 will be about educational outreach. And I uh, hope you'll follow us and be time travelers and go to our uh, website and learn more about what we do. But today I'm going to introduce to you our magical friend, Mark Ford, who, uh, did uh, did a presentation of animal medicine ways during our Native American cultural celebration. And um, my friend, we have extraordinary conversations and I'm glad I can share these this series with you with Mark because we have three separate presentations through uh, the next couple of months also. With that, I would like to introduce Mark Ford, who is works for incredible nonprofit partnership with Native Americans that does great work. And I'm going to turn it over to him to tell you a little bit about today and what they do. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in. Uh, Dogota, uh, she, Mark Ford, Gonse, um, introducing myself in Apache language and uh, like to welcome you all to this session. Uh, I do want to acknowledge, uh, I, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, where it's a beautiful, gonna be a beautiful 73 degrees. Sorry to rub it in to all those who have harsh weather today or this week. Uh, we do pay for it during the summertime. Uh, but anyway, and just uh, thank you for being here today and, and I welcome you with a warm, uh, open heart and a warm handshake. Um, I acknowledge the, the people who uh, land this was before it was settled uh, by many people from many cultures and all around the world here in the Phoenix area. The, the Hohokam people were the first people to really live in this land of the Phoenix desert, uh, Valley of the Sun, um, followed by the Tohono O'odham and the Pima. And so I honor and uh, uh, respect the ancestors of those people and um, the people who are still present on this land who are native uh, in this area. So I just want to start off with that. Um, I'm going to share my presentation now. Uh, for those who had joined us in uh, October for the cultural celebration, um, this will be a recap of what we talked. And for those who are new today, we, um, this will be hopefully some good information, helpful information. Uh, the half of this uh, presentation will be the slideshow just reviewing some points about animal medicine uh, and then the other half will be sharing an actual experience that Charlotte's going to share with us of her own encounter of animal medicine. And the next two sessions will focus on just that practicum or that personal experience of those people who are willing to share their experience and to kind of help un understand the medicine or the message of that animal experience or encounter. So if anyone is interested, uh, I'll share a little more at the end of this presentation how, how you can go about um, uh, sharing your story. Um, I'm going to head and... Hmm. One other thing, um, if you do have questions in the chat room, you're welcome to type those in and uh, Evan will send those questions over to Mark at the end of his presentation. So um, there is a, a little bio on the website about me, but just about myself, uh, Mark Ford. Um, my uh, background is uh, Chiricahua Apache and Tewa, which is uh, Pueblo tribes in uh, Northern New Mexico. 
uh, in Hispanic descent. I'm the director of community partnerships and tribal relations at Partnership with Native Americans. We're a nonprofit celebrating our 30th year of providing services and programs to uh, tribes in a nine state region. Um, those programs include anything from providing emergency COVID relief right now to a lot of the tribes that are still on lockdown, um, as well as uh, programs like scholarships. Um, we also provide food and water, food and nutrition education, uh, uh, leadership development, disaster preparedness, disaster relief programs, and a number of other programs um, that also we provide year round services. Uh, uh, we serve about 250,000 Native Americans annually, um, both in the Northern Plain states and in the Southwest. Um, anyway, I'm just honored to be with you all today and we'll go ahead and get started. So animal medicine, what, what does that mean? I think before we even talk about animal medicine, um, it's good to understand what does medicine mean, at least to Native Americans and indigenous communities. Um, Medicine is not something you just get at the pharmacy or the drugstore. It's something much more holistic. It's about spiritual health. It's about mental health. It's about relationship health. It's about being connected to the creator, to, uh, to other human beings and to other creatures and, and um, creation within uh, the realm of where we live. So uh, medicine is about holistic health. Uh, looking at mind, body, spirit, heart, um, and and making sure that we are doing well and are on a sacred path or a, a healthy path. Uh, for indigenous people, all creatures are viewed as sacred, and, but there's certain animals that often appear in stories and legends, whether it's about the creation story of this world, about how uh, fire was brought to the world, how, you know, how things have developed throughout uh, history, uh, very many, most Native American tribes use animals within those stories um, because animals were such an important part of interacting with human beings. So um, in many, um, many Native American uh, tribes, uh, animals were equal cre creation with us uh, on this land and this planet, uh, on, this, on this world. Um, you know, where those who grew up maybe more with the Judeo-Christian belief is that humans were to be over animals, to have dominion over animals and uh, subdue them, where in Native American understanding, uh, we are co-equals. Uh, we're no better than the animals. We're, we're all living in the same and we learn from each other. We work with each other. We respect each other. Uh, animals communicate with human beings. They deliver messages. They provide us physical, mental, spiritual healing and medicine. Um, and I'll share a little bit more about how that can happen later on in the presentation. Um, animal medicine is a way of life. It's a belief system that connects us with the creation and with the creator. Uh, and animals are relatives. Uh, there's a uh, Lakota word uh, uh, saying, uh, which is, means all our relatives. And uh, usually it's said at the, at the beginning or end of prayers. Um, so the understanding that we are connected with each other and not just as human beings, but as all beings. Um, what it's not, so this is important to understand too, it's not the worship of animals. Um, Native people don't worship animals. Huh? Even though in, in some cultures, uh, indigenous cultures, and that includes Germanic, Celtic, and others, that the belief there was animals that were gods. Uh, but it's not the worship uh, in at least a Native American, North American, Native American understanding. Uh, and it's not anthropomorphism, that understanding that animals think and talk and speak like human beings. Uh, they have their own language. They have their own uh, patterns of, of growth and living. Um, so it's not projecting our human qualities on animals. It's about um, accepting their qualities, but still interacting and communicating and relating with them. Uh, it's not totemism, meaning that I am, uh, I'm gonna choose my animal spirit guide. There's a lot of that that goes on in Facebook. In fact, there was one of those game apps where you can like, pick your animal spirit guide and which one fits you the best. So it, it's, it's not um, that kind of thing. It's, it's more of just understanding that we are connected and understanding and deepening the relationship we have with our brother and sister animals. 
Um, and it's not cultural appropriation. You know, one of the images that's been popping up over the news all the time is when they had the, the rioting at the uh, Capitol, uh, the one man who called himself a shaman wearing the horns and animal skins and uh, that's cult cultural appropriation. Now, whether he was trained as a shaman, I, I'm not sure, but it's it's people taking on um, those um, uh, spiritualities or those beliefs and doing it as a show, like a Halloween costume, rather than really understanding and respecting that spirituality or that culture. So there has been a long tradition with the Native American communities uh, about honoring animals. Um, ceremonies were done uh, for hunting and fishing. Um, before um, uh, tribes or communities would go out hunting or fishing, they would do dances or, or drum songs and, and honor the animals that they were going to, to hunt because they knew that these animals were going to give up their lives so, these, so the people could live, they could exist, they could eat. Um, they could grow. So uh, it's very important to understand when an animal gives its life, um, either through hunting or fishing or dies suddenly, that its spirit is honored. Uh, storytelling. So animals I mentioned, you know, um, they talk about creation. They're, they're in all the stories and mythology. Uh, they're Im embedded in, in cultural traditions. Uh, there are ceremonies that honor sacred animals. Um, here in the Southwest, a number of the Pueblos in New Mexico and other tribes have like the eagle dance. They have the deer dance. There's, there's different uh, dances and ceremonies that honor the spirits of the animals, the animals that are sacred to each of those tribes or those communities. Animal artifacts are used for clothing. Uh, regalia, regalia are, are the... Um, the clothing that are used for ceremonies, for powwows. So the shirt I'm wearing right now is a ribbon shirt. Um, there's no animal uh, that I know of uh, uh, any type of artifacts on here. But this is a traditional shirt used at ceremonies or powwows or native events. Um, so, uh, so, so sometimes animal artifacts are used for that. Uh, weapons, blankets, tools, and jewelry. Um, Thanksgiving and honoring rituals before conception. So uh, offering prayers or um, uh, to honor the life of the animals or plants too that gave up their lives so we can, we can eat and we can live. Um, and then utilizing all parts of an animal. So when an animal was hunted, it wasn't just the meat that was used, but, but bones and sinew and fur and everything was never wasted. Uh, and that's a way of honoring the animal. Uh, and then many times um, Native people believe that when you consume a deer or a bear or a buffalo, that we also, whatever we consume, we take on the essence of that animal. And so uh, we take on the energy and the life force. And so uh, that means I take on bear medicine or deer medicine or whatever I'm eating, I'm taking on that medicine. So uh, it's a sacred event. It's not just buying you know, a pack of hamburger or frozen chicken breasts at the store. There's no relationship with that animal, um, you know? And, and so it, it's, it's about a different understanding that this animal was a living being and they gave up their life for us. Um, medicine uh, is also used, uh, and, and I'm talking about medicines such as tinctures or teas or herbal medicines or medicines from the animal. So bones or organs or other parts of animals uh, were used to help increase the health of those who were sick in communities. Uh, many animal medicines are passed down in fables and folklore uh, from generation to generation. And um, many animals are symbols uh, for guides, they're protectors, they're mischief makers. Um, and we'll learn some of those um, understandings of animals among different tribes. And some tribes may have an understanding of an animal that's totally different or opposite from other tribes. So every region or every tribe or even within different communities in a tribe may have a different understanding or traditions or ceremonies uh, centered around animals. Uh, animal medicine and many Native American and indigenous cultures are based on the characteristics of the animal, while others are based on uh, spiritual beliefs. Uh, for instance, the Yaqui tribes, which are uh, mostly found in southern Arizona and in Mexico, um, 
The deer is their main sacred animal. It represents goodness. It represents, it represents sacrifice, self-sacrifice. Uh, and, and so there's deer songs and dances that are very sacred to, to the Yaqui people. Um, it shows that good will conquer over evil and that uh, there's a way to keep harmony in our world. Uh, looking at our relationship with animals, um, animals warn us of danger. Uh, changes of climate, of uh, seasons, and of natural disasters. Uh, I remember growing up, um, taking a walk with my grandfather, and we were walking along and saw this ant pile. If you look at that middle picture there on the on the screen, uh, it's an ant pile where the the mound is is really high up. Um, and my grandfather would say, "Oh, it's going to be raining soon because the ants are telling us that." So ants give messages about. Um, uh, you know, about the weather patterns or things that are going to happen. Another thing I remember is seeing um, uh, a, a deer with two uh, or a doe with two fawns. And again, my grandfather said, I mean, it's going to be a very harsh winter because when uh, the does start having twin fawns, it means that most likely one is not going to survive because it'll be a very harsh winter. So it's to kind of keep the, the, the life cycle going. So one will survive. Um, there's other things too. I remember when um, I was in California back in the early 70s and I was maybe like 11 years old and I was there for the earthquake that hit Los Angeles. I wanna say it was 1970, 70, somewhere, 70, 72. And uh, I remember our dogs hiding under the beds, whimpering before the earthquake happened. I was looking outside cause we were getting ready for school and the birds were circling, making this huge circle um, and just like, a big circle going around and around, all of a sudden the earthquake hits. So, so paying attention to animals can tell us a lot about what's going on. Um, animals are teachers. They teach us how to hunt, how to work together, how to forage, how to prepare and store food. You look at that top picture in the slideshow, it's a little beagle, I think, digging a, a bone. Uh, there's a reason that dogs dig bones and other animals dig bones. And what they're doing is letting it ferment. And so that way the probiotics build, that good bacteria builds in that bone. And so when they eat it, uh, they're, they're actually eating a healthy meal because it's, it's providing good bacteria in their digestive system and um, providing them health. So that's where we learned how to ferment uh, things. Um, so we watch the animals and so our ancestors in all cultures too, in, uh, whether Germanic, cultic, Asian, uh, whatever it was, African cultures, they learned from the animals uh, what was poisonous or not poisonous, what are, what are proper things to eat, what are healthy things to eat. So we learned from the animals how to live and how to socialize, you know, look at um, those uh, animals who take care of their, their youth or their, their young, um, those who are the, who, you know, it, we learn from them. So there are companions. I mean, you know, many times, uh, and we hear this when, uh, when our pets die, it's not just a pet, they're a member of the family. You know, whether it's a dog, a cat, a bird, whatever it is, it, uh, we have a connection with them and, and, and they, they bring us a life and love and, and service. Uh, you know, our horses and uh, other animals who are working for us, uh, uh, they teach us how to be dedicated and committed uh, animals assist us with prayer and ceremony and, and spirituality. Um, so, you know, honoring their spirit and the way they respect the earth, the way they respect each other, the way that they try to live their lives teaches us how we should also live our lives. Um, animals teach us what are poisonous and what are, are good plants for us. Um, they can touch it, teach us how to be better relatives and human beings. So they don't judge. Understanding animal medicine. So animal medicine comes to us when we need it the most. We just have to pay attention and look for it. Um, so if we're going through some issues, um, I think it's okay to ask the creator, please give me a sign what I should do. And sometimes that sign may come in an animal form, in an animal encounter. And we will share some of those uh, experiences in the next couple months. 
of people who had those encounters, who received a message, who received that medicine that they needed um, to give them hope or inspiration. Um, animals choose us to communicate and interact with, and it's up to us to accept that relationship. Uh, so it's not us looking for our spirit guides, or uh, it's, it's about accepting the invitation that they give to us to interact with them and to accept that medicine or that message or both. Uh, animals communicate to us vocally, behaviorally. Um, they, uh, they'll chirp at us or yell at us, they'll bark at us, so whatever it is. And sometimes their behavior, if it's different than what we've learned about what that behavior is, they're trying to get a message to us. So it's important for us to, to really pay attention. Uh, animals can speak to us in our dreams. Many of us do dream of animals. Um, whether it's a, a pet that we had or had, maybe it's an animal that we've never encountered before. Maybe it's an animal that we've always had an affection or an affiliation towards. Um, and it's not just night dreams, but sometimes daydreams, uh, animals will come to us. So if we meditate or something, um, maybe an animal will come to our head. So uh, we, they do speak to us, not only in, in the outside world, but in our, in our, in our dream world. Um, Animals who speak with us may be ones that we are attracted to, ones that we are repulsed by, or ones that maybe we never even thought about and all of a sudden they show up. So uh, we're gonna talk about these three different uh, types of ex experiences with animal medicine um, towards the end of this slideshow. Uh, so they, they're ones that we're attracted to, the ones we're repulsed by, or ones that just kind of pop into our lives. If they communicate with us um, in an, an unusual manner, it may usually signify that that is an urgent medicine or important medicine that we need to pay attention to and to receive. So, um, so if you see a, uh, an elephant walking across the street in front of you as you're driving to work, that is a very dramatic sign that that animal is saying, pay attention. Uh, now, maybe escape from the circus or the zoo or whatever, but, you know, I'm sure there's some logical, logistic uh, explanation for that. But the fact that we see something unusual or, you know, um, uh, it, it's telling us pay attention closely. It's really shouting at us. So we're going to now talk about those three categories of animal medicine. Um, uh, it, it's interesting because Native people really don't, think in these categories or um, uh, give sessions like this. this. It's something that you grow up with. It's something that you learn from your, your families, your elders, uh, the medicine people um, who pass on the cultures and traditions. So, um, so this is, we're doing this so people who are non from non-indigenous cultures can have a better understanding of, of, of um, animal medicine. So, so one type of animal medicine is those that we, those animals that we have an attraction or affinity towards. Maybe it's something that we always, uh, like when you go to the zoo, what's the first animal you want to go see, you know? Um, or if uh, I had a friend, she, the te the panda bear is her favorite animal. She has pandas all over her house, little ceramic figurines, her towels and sheets and blankets. She has pictures of pandas everywhere that is her medicine for her when she needs it the most and so um, uh, there's people who do that uh, so if you have an animal or several animals that you have a strong attraction to there is a connection there there's that invitation from the animal and what they do is they have qualities or abilities that um, that help us enhance our own skills, our own talents, our own good qualities. Um, they come to us when we need them the most, and sometimes they choose to stay with us our whole life. Um, they bring a positive mes message, and they bring medicine that accentuates our strengths and enriches our spirits. So that's the what we call affirming animal medicine. Um, then there's what we call the repulsive or frightening medicine. Uh, th th these are uh, animals that maybe we fear or repulse by or loathe. Um, they have qualities or attributes that we dislike, that we're disgusted by, uh, that we're fearful of. Um, 
they they are a powerful what we call shadow medicine they help us to look at those things that we have a t difficult time looking at whether it's uh, things about ourselves personally maybe things that we're going through in our life that are unresolved uh, relationships or experiences that we had uh, maybe regrets um, so they help us to address those things to face those things uh, they can teach us new skills and they're very powerful medicine if we listen to them we pay attention to that medicine or to that that uh, message that they give us uh, and they help us overcome uh, life obstacles and i'm going to give some examples of each of these um, as well as we uh, at the very end of this uh, slideshow uh, so the other um, uh, animal medicine type, we could call it just a simple messenger. These are animals that just pop into our life to deliver a message uh, and then they leave. Um, they bring a little medicine, they leave. Um, so it could be a simple one or it can come, um, uh, you know, it could come as like a blessing or an affirmation, but it can come as a warning. Uh, it could be a challenge or an invitation to change or an invitation to look at things a little bit differently. So, um, uh, but they, but they show up and then they leave. So uh, they, like I say, it could be the elephant walking across the road. It could be a little bird that's chirping outside. I think what's important to understand though too is that not every animal encounter uh, that we have is an animal message or medicine. So walking outside and, oh, there's a sparrow or a pigeon flying by. There could be a message in it, but most likely not. They're just going on there with their lives like we are too. But I think um, there are animals who do pop into our life with specific, and I think a lot of people, when they stop and think about it, uh, it'll stick with you. There is a message here. So why am I still thinking about that pigeon uh, that just pooped on my car? <laughs> so, uh, uh, so there is, what does that poop mean? Well, maybe it just had a release uh, itself, uh, or maybe there is a message. So, you know, and if that, if, if I keep thinking, oh, it's, okay, it's just poop. Uh, you, but if there's a message here, it's like, okay, if there's maybe my car is covered in poop, maybe the message is there that, you know, do I feel like life is pooping on me? I don't know. Maybe that little bird is helping us to look at that. So anyway, it's not always the case that when an animal flies by or walks by, that there's a deep, profound medicine or message. It could just be doing, like I said, going on with its life. So we just have to kind of determine that and discern that. So how do we work with animal medicine? So the first thing um, we have to do is acknowledge when it happens. Um, if we had an encounter with a bear, with a uh, mountain lion, with a, an animal that's um, usually something we wouldn't normally do, we have to encounter that. Okay, what did that mean? You know, um, for me, I always think of what day was that on, what time of the year, what time of the day was it, um, because sometimes those things have a significance when we're working with animal medicine. Uh, write down or recall all the details about the experience. Um, so it's very important to, to do that later on, you know, even after it happens, if you do it at night, if you keep a diary or a journal, sometimes that's helpful as well. Um, what was it? A, it was a male or female? Uh, what's, uh, what color was it? Did I feel it was a young one or an older uh, one? Um, you know, uh, were there any things, did it have a wounded foot or a broken wing? So any specifics about that, uh, is important in helping understand that message or uh, the medicine. And then what are the characteristics or qualities, physical attributes and habits that you find admirable or uh, attractive or repulsive and frightening? List those things. So, you know, I'm thinking uh, like the owl is, uh, is, an, is a medicine that uh, has been with me most of my life. And so when I think of owl, it's um, uh, one who sees in the dark one who's able to have incredible vision. Um, it can uh, turn its head around almost completely. So that flexibility of knowing what's behind me and seeing all around me, um, those are important qualities that Al is telling me to pay attention to. So, um, so again, it, it's important to, to list those things. Um, 
what is the significance of that animal in the culture I grew up in, and then uh, other cultures or faith systems um, as well to look at that. So a, a lot of times, you know, growing up as, as a Catholic Christian, um, you know, the snake is evil. You know, it represents the devil in the Bible. And, um, but in other cultures, it represents resurrection, or it could represent a uh, rebirth uh, or vibrations because uh, snakes are on the ground. They feel the vibrations of the earth. They can feel the heartbeat of mother earth. And so they are more sensitive. They're more attuned to, to the, the heartbeat and of, of all of life, but also of nature. So, so look at, at what your own tradition and culture, what you learned about the animal growing up, but then also what do other cultures and faith traditions say about that animal? Uh, is there something I can learn from that? Uh, reflect on what's going on in your life. Are, are you struggling with something? Have you had an experience uh, recently, a uh, transition, uh, had an accomplishment? So, so sometimes they come to us to help us identify those issues or those blessings or those good things that have happened and, and to, to give us the message or give us that medicine we need to celebrate or to, to help us face those issues. Um, Meditate on the significance of the animal encounter and what's going on in your life. See if there's a, a other like-minded people or that you could share that experience with and, and to give you some feedback. And that's what we're going to be doing today and in the next two sessions. Uh, so I'm just going to go through a couple of these for the sake of time. Uh, I think we'll... Um, so, so this would be an example of looking at one animal and what uh, cultures, especially native cultures, but then what other cultures say about the animal. So in, in, in Native American cultures, especially in the Southwest, the bear represents healing. Um, this is a, what we call a Zuni heartline bear. So the Zuni tribe has taken the bear and they have this line that goes from its mouth into its body, meaning that's how medicine is taken in. Um, and it teaches us to do the same, whether it's actual medicine that we consume physically or spiritual medicine. And so um, it's a famous uh, drawing that you'll see many times here in the Southwest and other drive, uh, tribes here in the Southwest have also adopted this. What so represents healing? Bear taught human beings about medicine and medicine ways. It's a restoration of harmony and balance. Uh, the heartline bear begins where breath gives life and points to the spirit where faith and inner strength is going through the body. So um, it's feminine energy. It could represent uh, nurturing and maternal power. Uh, it represents, uh, it's one of the most powerful uh, animals in, in most native cultures, but in the Southwest especially, it's a guardian of the West, and it has the power to heal and transform passions into true wisdom. Um, and then here's a few pointers about what other cultures. So for the Vikings, it's strength and courage. Um, for many other cultures, fearlessness. Uh, for the Greek Roman cultures, it was about fertility and feminine power. Uh, the Eskimo Inuit tribes, uh, it's about resurrection and rebirth. So that's just an example of how we can look at an animal that has come into our lives to bring medicine or a message and to start strategizing, okay, what does it mean, both in the culture and traditions I grew up, but also in others. And then I can start deciphering uh, the medicine or the message that is in that encounter, that experience. Uh, so we'll take a look at the snake because, like I mentioned, in some cultures, especially the Judeo-Christian, it represents evilness and, and cunningness. Um, for Native Americans, there's a few uh, options. Again, different tribes have different understandings. So um, in the Pueblo tribes, it's fertility. In the, with the Ojibwe, it was uh, healing. Uh, the Hopi, they're a prayer messenger. In fact, they they dance. They have a, a a kachina ceremony where they dance with life rattlesnakes. Um, uh, in, in the Lakota and Blackfoot traditions, they're, they're a monster that swallows human beings. Uh, again, I mentioned that uh, they, have, they, they regulate vibrations. Uh, so they are on a spiritual, higher spiritual vibration, invite us to do the same. Um, other cultures, uh, sexuality, fertility with the Babylonian, some pre power warding off e Egyptian or warding off evil with the Egyptians. So, we're in Judeo Christian beliefs, it represents evil with the Egyptians, it was warding off evil. Um, for the Greek and Roman, if you remember, uh, 
any doctors or medical insignia is a staff with two snakes intertwined. Um, it represents healing. So with uh, the Greek and Roman traditions and understanding it, it, it was a healing. Um, and then uh, other cultures, rebirth and resurrection, and then their guardians in Cambodia and Asia. So um, I am going to stop here. Were there any questions that came up at all? No questions. No questions. Sorry, just checking here. Just people commenting how, you know, some of their experiences. Uh, Natalie Stevens, that she never thought of animals as teachers. Uh, Doreen Breedlove comments that she appreciates hearing that animals are co-equals. Linda Deeb, Debbie, says that she's repulsed by lizards, the ones that come into her house. Um, also, she loves wolves. Awesome. Um, Linda actually asks, what is the significance of lizards? I think that would depend on the type of lizard um, and the experience of lizards. So there's so many different types. Um, you know, those, those, those that are amphibious, those who are desert lizards, those who are mountain lizards. I mean, so I think it depends. There's tropical lizards. So it would have to look at the significance of that specific lizard that was encountered. Um, and, you know, some of them are able to change colors. Some, when you cut off the tail, that tail will grow back. So there's um, a lot of different significance about lizards um, uh, in general, um, their abilities, their physical abilities, the way they're, they're able to eat with their tongue. Some lizards have eyes that can look in different directions. So I, I again, would have to look at um, that specific uh, species or grouping of lizards and and encounter that. So um, um, anyway, that's something if, uh, she, if you're interested in doing that, I'll tell you at the very end how you can share your experience and we can do that in one of the next two upcoming sessions. Cause we'll have time to do good three or four um, sharings of experiences in the next uh, two sessions. Um, and speaking of that, we're now gonna go into our experience of uh, Charlotte um, is going to share with us her experience that she had. Um, so hello, Charlotte. I have a disclaimer. I'm your, I'm his backup person today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had somebody lined up and um, there was something going on. They weren't able to participate uh, um, in, in a discussion forum. So uh, they'll be on with us next time around. So- I'm honored to share this because it is, it is some, it's another bit of living our lives and um, just a little sidebar. Also, one reason why we brought in the series with Mark is that we um, are sharing a joint exhibit with Crystal Bridges right now called Companion Species. We are all related and this talk could not be even more important that, that we all realize that everything's alive around us to live a more present life, you know, and for all of you, whatever your profession is, um, we also look at the idea of um, whatever you do that, you know, what is the return on investment our, on our environment and all of our relations. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. So. Um, so Charlotte, would you like to share with us your experience of, first of all, the, the animal medicine that you encountered and, uh, uh, maybe the, the time or date or a time of the year, any of those things would be very helpful. I would. I think it was the second year I was working at the Museum of Native American History and uh, it was autumn, which is one of my favorite months. And uh, we have a teepee that, you know, when you come to Bentonville, uh, we're the first teepee on the left when you, on Central. Um, so I have to walk through the gravel to put up the open sign in the morning. And I actually talked to my best, my BFF in Virginia in the morning and talking about life and family and all that. And she was having some difficult times and I was in transition. And when I walked past the teepee, a red fox ran out in front of me and my phone with Carrie. And I thought, wow, that was significant, you know, and I, but I went about my day and, and, uh, you know, thought about what is, what did that mean? Because you don't usually see a red fox in the morning running out of a teepee. And so I let it go. And about a week or so later, I live 
um, in a valley and I'm driving to work at the same time. It's about eight ish in the morning and a gray fox stops in front of the road and uh, just stops and looks at me, just stays there. And I thought two foxes, well, I guess I better pay attention to this. And um, I did a little research on it and it seemed like what they were telling me was just right on the money. It's like that in, I needed to be more invisible. I needed to be the fox that was you know, unseen and I could just observe what was going on. Sometimes we all need to be quiet and listen and um, take care of your family. And that's what I took out of it. And it was right on the money because both of us, Carrie and I both probably need to a little more listening, a little more quiet and a lot more observation. Great. Great. It's interesting you had a red fox and a gray fox. So two different types of fox, even though in the same fox family. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me ask you, Charlotte, uh, in that experience, did you sense um, in encountering these fox what gender they were, or even like the energy that they were um, giving to you uh, in that encounter? Were they male or female? Um, did you pick that up? Were they young? Were they older fox or more mature fox? Uh, did you pick up anything on that? I, I did not. I mean, if I, I would be making that completely up at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, if one was male, if the red fox was female and the gray fox was male, I, I don't know. Yeah. And, and that's something that's not real important, but sometimes people pick up either um, they recognize it's a male or female. And it's easier to distinguish like with birds because mm -hmm. male, uh, male birds are usually more colorful or, you know, bigger or something like that. Same with buck, you know, bucks or um, mm -hmm. bison or, you know, any, uh, there's certain male, but there's other animals. You, you kids hard to tell, but sometimes people pick up. I think that was a, a female fox or a male fox because maybe it's, mm -hmm. it's contributing to the message or the medicine that they need to receive. But not everybody does that, and that's okay. Um, and did you sense like the age of, of them? Or did they look like pups or young or mature? Or they was it? No, they weren't. They weren't young pups at all. Okay. I mean, I, I, I couldn't guess, but they weren't elders either. Right. So just kind of mature fox. Mm -hmm. So okay, um, just those little kind of things sometimes help. Um, and they looked like healthy normal foxes, the fox that you would see in, um, in, in pictures or in movies or how you, you would think would see, you'd see fox. But I really felt that they were there as counsel. You know, I mean, it was probably one of the best, you know, I always say you don't need a, a, a shrink if you got good friends or great, you know, uh, paying attention to the magic of the world. And I really felt that was the best counsel I could have gotten at that point. Great. And then let me ask you, um, with the gray fox, how long was that encounter where you just kind of looked at each other? Um, do you remember how? It was probably about a, you know, maybe just a minute, but it seemed like it was just this moment in time that was, you know, eternal that I'll never forget. Yeah. You know? And that's but a common, just... yeah, that's a common experience when a person encounters an animal and you're just looking at each other. Cause I've heard this from other people too. It may have been just a few seconds or not even a minute, but it felt like, an mm -hmm. like it was a long time because I can, that connection I can see him today, you know, and it's, it's just a two lane road, mm -hmm. you know, that I live on. So I wasn't a road hazard or anything. I was out right. There. Right. So you shared with us a little bit about the message that you think that it, it, it was giving to you. Um, uh, what I would like to do is uh, share with everyone here, and then we can look at the Charlotte to see if any of these things result. So, what I did was I put together a, um, a little sheet um, showing, uh, let me share this with, uh, with everybody on, on the session. So this is uh, the red fox and a gray fox. And so uh, what I wanted to do was to, to share other cultural um, understandings or significance of the fox. Um, so with, with Native American, um, at least here in the north, northern, uh, I'm sorry, North America, the Southwest, a lot of the tribes see uh, the fox as uh, representing keenness or slyness and benevolence. Uh, so a goodness, it's like good luck when you see one. Northern Plains, there's a lot of wisdom and intelligence in the fox. With the Blackfoot and Apache uh, tribes, 
there are stories and understanding that uh, Fox was able to to be able to go into the heavens or into other worlds and be able to to uh, uh, walk and communicate in those other realms. And so they brought fire. They st actually stole fire from the heavens or from the sun and brought it to human beings. So human beings could use it to cook and to keep warm and to have light at night. So, um, so the, the fox was a helper and um, for the, uh, a number of tribes also have fox clans. Um, many tribes have clans, um, not all tribes, but a lot of tribes have clans. And so a number of them honor the fox uh, with a clan name. Um, the Northern Woodlands tribes believe that fox was a noble and wise animal symbolizing the gift of anticipation, observation, and stealth. You mentioned it was like listening, watching, you know, that, that, that mess was part of the message for you. So other, looking at other, um, uh, the meaning of fox in other cultures. So looking at in, in the East, in the Orient, uh, the Japanese revolve a mythical status around the creature that it, um, it oscillates between symbols of good fortune, uh, possessor of a tremendous intelligence, but also cunning. Uh, the Far Eastern symbolism for fox refers to them as the communicator, bringing the messages of the ancestors and of ghosts. So sometimes understanding that they're bringing the messages from those who've gone before us. Um, there's only, uh, there's a few Eastern that see it in a negative life. It's a shapeshifter, kind of like it, here in the Southwest, a lot of the tribe, or I should say the Navajo tribe sees uh, the coyote as a shapeshifter. And, um, it, it turns into feminine uh, uh, figure and it entices and seduces weak, weak willed men. Um, so it can change into a plant or other creature too. Um, so it's, it's uh, just a different understanding. Uh, Christian symbolism is kind of a negative. It's just actually Judeo-Christian symbolism because in the book of Solomon, um, Solomon refers to uh, the fox as uh, um, kind of a warning um, and to abstain from corruption and, uh, and to be pious and virtuous. Uh, for the Celtic, it was very much similar to a lot of the Native Americans here in the United States that it represents wisdom and keen insight. Uh, it's a spirit guide and a creature that knows the trees better than anybody else. It symbolizes the immediate need to adapt, to employ wisdom and cleverness and think strategically and quickly. Um, under the African cultures, um, they regard the fox as a creature of adaptability, cunningness, strategy, intelligence, shrewdness, trickery, action, resourcefulness, patience, quick wit, overcoming obstacles, agility, focus, determination, and, and a lot more. Uh, the fox is a sign of warning that bad things may be in the horizon. So uh, to prepare for them and to avoid harm and danger. Uh, fox also symbolizes protection. I understand in some uh, indigenous uh, African tribal communities that they have a, an image or some kind of a, a figurine of a fox because it protects the home and the family. Um, and that a fox, uh, the sound of a fox can create a ward off of witches and evil spirits. Um, so there's some similar, uh, similar similarity between the indigenous cultures in Africa and Europe and um, in Asia and in United and in uh, North America. But there's also a lot more um, that the African symbol of the African sea fox uh, in their indigenous cultures. Um, other observations and meanings. So these are some things to think about too. Um, the fox is a creature that you usually only see during the dusk and dawn. You saw it in the morning when it was bright outside. So seeing a fox during daylight uh, could have some significance, meaning that that message is much more clear and in the light. Um, so they are sometimes seen as uh, an animal that lives both in the light and dark in the in-between worlds of lightness and darkness. Um, the other thing that's parallel with that is that it's a creature that is both dog and cat-like. It has qualities of both. So um, is it more related to dogs? Is it more related to cats? It's one of those creatures that's both, a little of both. So again, it lives in between the world of dogness and catness. Um, 
so there's something about it that has like two spirits or two um it's two energies uh, so the light and darkness and cat and darkness and i mean cat and dogness and so there's something about that other things we think about as a, as a fox at least growing up in the western american culture you we hear the saying clever as a fox um I'm not sure what that means, but there is showing that the fox is someone who's smart and cunning and sly and, and keen. Many of the other cultures we've heard about mention that. Um, and that they're playful. You see them hopping around, playing, chasing after rabbits, whatever it is. Um, uh, the other thing about it is when a fox hunts, it finds it, it when it sees its prey, it looks like a like an arrow, its little body its noise, its nose points and its tail points. So it's like an arrow ready to be shot to go after what it's hunting. So it's very uh, focused on whatever it's going to do. Um, the fox encourages us, us to think outside of the box, to use our intelligence differently and in more creative ways. Um, it brings to us a mes message to try to approach our circumstances differently than our, we no, normally would, to be aware of our habits and to try something uh, of a different angle uh, or see things in a different angle. Uh, it also reminds us that we must utilize our resources, both seen and unseen, to accomplish our goals. So I, I was wondering, Charlotte, did any of these things pop out to you that resonate with your experience uh, or encounter with the fox? Well, I, I, it's very interesting, the dog catness, because I, I kind of am both of those, you know, uh, those relations. You know, I, I have, I'm very auditory, you know, again, someone's voice makes me wag my tail or I want to bite you. Um, and I'm a cat. <laughs> <laughs> Simple as that. But um, I, a lot of that, I think, is, you know, uh, interesting, just that creative uh, solution to problems coming up, but also, you know, ever faithful to the magic of the, of the moment that uh, I'm just, I just think, you know, every day is a brand new day and uh, to be present, you know, and, and nature is so magical out there. And I just felt I was, it was just grace that those separate days, you know, to pay attention, mm -hmm. you know, as mm -hmm. a, a method. it's like your dreams. Uh, dreams or if you start learning to write those down and pay attention if I dream about a fox and you dream about a fox that symbolism is completely different between us right you know what that means you know so only I can enter that and Charlotte thank you so much for sharing your experiences um, I hope other people will too because it is it, this is such an amazing thing to add to our lives you know um, I just always want to say put this down, there's magic afoot, you know, you'll miss a deer standing on its head if you're doing this. Exactly, exactly. Sad. Okay. Uh, and just because we have about five minutes left, um, I want to share with our, um, our uh, presenters here, I'm sorry, our the participants here for the session, uh, if you are interested in sharing an experience like Charlotte did, it'll be done in that same format. What we do ask you, there is a form on the website uh, for the museum um that ans asks some of those questions that i asked charlotte uh, it's to give some information about the animal experience or encounter you had um you know some of the the details of what that what you experienced where it was located the time of you know, the time or the season or um anything you share and then your interpretation of that and then what we'd like to do is to uh share that have it even though it's written down i would like to do a conversation with that person to kind of dig out some more details because when we share an experience that happened no longer how long ago it was we relive it and that medicine comes back that message comes back um and whether it is in uh, one of the experiences we had with an, an uh, that was affirming that was a, a gifted a uh, blessing animal encounter uh which i think that was for you charlotte uh, or if it was something that made us fearful or something that we were frightened about or, you know, that we were repulsed by. It could be one of those experiences as well with an animal or just an animal that just came in and left a message and, and left kind of like what Fox did with you, Charlotte. Um, 
So it, we would love to have people share those experiences. Uh, I, we would just ask you to fill out that form. So I have the information, I'll contact you. We could set up an appointment to talk about it before we get online. Um, and then we can do a conversation just like Charlotte and I had. Uh, I'll do some research on the animal, on what other cultures say about it, um, and to see if there's anything else that resonates with you, any deeper message or um, thing that comes to mind. And like I said, these are very sacred experiences. So I know some people don't feel comfortable doing that. And there's some animal experiences that you share and or you may never want to share because they were so deeply personal to you. So those, uh, you know, I respect that there's some I will, I'll never be able to share because people like, oh yeah, you're crazy. Um, but, uh, but there's some that people would be willing to share. And if you want to do that, please do that. And uh, also I want you to go and look up partnership with Native Americans uh, and see the good work that Mark does. And uh, always an honor to have you here, my friend. Thank you so much for this experience. And and um, if anyone has any you know, other questions, you're welcome to contact me. Uh, I'm going to give my uh, work email address. Uh, it's M as in Mark, Ford, F-O-R-D, at Native Partnership, all one word, dot org. M Ford at Native Partnership dot org. So even if you had an experience that you wanted to share that you don't want to share in a session, you know, and you just want to help, need some help. Uh, looking at that and understanding the medicine, I'd be happy to walk that with you and and uh, to see if there's something you know I can guide you with on that experience and that encounter. Yeah, great. Well, and, thank and you all so much. Lucky you if you get to talk to if you get to talk to Mark. I mean, I it is a treasure to get to have any time to conversations. I wish you're my next door neighbor. I would enjoy that so much. But um, one other thing, you can go to our uh, website. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter to always stay in touch with the programming that we're doing because Mark will be back same time, same station in March and uh, April. Um, tomorrow, there's one more presentation of our series called Hear Our Voices that's curated by the fabulous Gail Ross. Uh, we're going to feature um, Richard Zane Smith, who's Wine Dot, and he is one great potter. I mean, he is incredible. And from he's just making sure that we keep, you know, uh, languages still in existence. Um, he works with, um, he, he actually, we're working on something with him later on this summer called I haven't named it yet. I think it's called Shards of History. But he'll take a shard that might come from the Northeast and study it to make sure that that technique is not lost in that tradition. It's so exciting to work with him. And then next week, uh, a companion to this is the series called Indigenuity. And that will be next Thursday at 3 o'clock with the incredible Professor Dan Wildcat from the Haskell Indian Nation University. And Indigenuity is the... Uh, is tradition and innovation coming together in relation to all of our relations on the planet. So uh, whether you're in urban planning, architecture, uh, whatever, uh, this is the theme of our year that we're taking all the way to our Native American cultural celebration. So from fashion designers to astronauts, I think it's gonna be a lot of fun to, um, you know, why build a better, better mousetrap, you know, unless it is sustainable. Um, with that thought and that tirade, rah, um, again, thank you all. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow and Evan or hear our voices. Thank you, my friend. I'll see you, thank you. soon. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Warm wishes <laughs> from Arkansas. <laughs>